Good morning. Thank you very much for those kind words and for the invitation to deliver the Carlisle Marnie lecture here at Carson Newman University. I have to say that I never met or never even heard of Carlisle Marnie growing up. But uh, later, when I was an American Baptist, I joined the Baptist Peace Fellowship in North America, and I heard a lot of my Southern Baptist friends talking about this pioneering pastor who stood for justice and peace. And Marnie was a bright beacon to a rising generation, a role model for how to put a dynamic faith in Jesus Christ into practice in our world today. And so it's an honor for me to be invited to address you in this particular forum named after such a special leader. Well, I'm a preacher, among other things, and so I'd like to begin by looking at a biblical text, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, where it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know, as uh, I heard the genesis for this invitation came because some of you uh, enjoyed, at least I think you did, uh, reading that required text, uh, uh, Peace Warrior my memoir. And yes, I am old enough to have written a memoir. And that title reflects my identity, Peace Warrior, though I would also add the word nonviolent to it. How do I think of myself? I think of myself as a nonviolent peace warrior. My personal story is captured in that phrase. I grew up in a military family, the son of a career Air Force chaplain. All my heroes were military people. I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy and to be a fighter pilot, but my eyes were too bad, and so I settled for going to Wheaton College, where I was in ROTC my freshman year. And when I got, then as a freshman, I got into an argument with Christy, who was a friend in our campus uh, Bible study group. The war in Vietnam was going on, and Christy and I got into an argument about war and our faith. And I argued that the Christian position is just war theory and that Vietnam was a just war. Now, Christy just wasn't as good a debater as I was. I was debating around her and around her, but she had the right question. And she wouldn't let me get away from that question. She said, Dan, what does Jesus say? She said, you have accepted Jesus as your Lord What does Jesus say? You're committed to follow him. What does Jesus say? So that night, I went to my dorm room, and I intensely read through the Gospels with that question about what Jesus says about war and peace. And I had what I call my second conversion. My first conversion, giving my life to Christ, was supported by my family and all that I held dear growing up. But this second conversion, turning away from the ways of war and toward the ways of peace, was a complete turnaround from my family traditions, from my heroes, from my culture. And it's been a long, complex journey with many twists and turns since that conversation with Christy and my night with the Gospels. And there is much that I still value in warrior culture. Discipline, courage, the willingness to sacrifice oneself for the good of a larger community, strategic thinking, warriors can be worthy of our honor. But as a follower of Jesus, this warrior needed to be baptized into nonviolence and respond to the call of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Thus, I see myself as the nonviolent peace warrior. However, this is not just a personal matter. I think the call to the ways of peace is one that stands before the entire community that calls Jesus Christ Lord, as well as the entire human community, especially at this point in our history. So to begin expanding our discussion, let me introduce to you this book from Michael Hart, The 100, a ranking of the most influential persons in history. And Hart ranks people from across the world in all kinds of walks of life for their actual impact in human history. And so 
Those of you who've read the book, you have to uh, kind of be silent. But for the rest of you, who do you think that Hart ranked as number one, the most influential person in all of human history? Jesus? Now, we're not talking about heaven and hell, salvation, all that kind of stuff. We're talking about actual impact in history. You want to stick with Jesus? Genghis Khan, I think, is on the list somewhere, but uh, no? Number one. Gandhi, honorable mention, although I, I disagree with him on that. He ranks Muhammad as number one, the most influential person in human history for starting Islam, a major world religion, but also uh, Muhammad is a political leader, what he did and the, the development of the uh, Arab civilization that, that uh, stood between uh, the ancient world and all the wisdom of the ancient world and then the Renaissance that wouldn't have happened without all that happened in the Arab culture there. Um, Muhammad, number one. He has Isaac Newton as number two. And Jesus is number three. And he, as he's going through it, he talks about Jesus, the impact of Christianity, and uh, all that has happened uh, because of Christianity. And then he gets into the teaching of Jesus and things like the Golden Rule. You know, that's in other religions too. And, and he finally comes that that there's one part of Jesus' teaching that was nowhere else. And, and that's when he says, love your enemies. And he goes, ex unpacks that a little bit, and he says, now these ideas about loving enemies, turning the other cheek, etc., which were not a part of the Judaism of Jesus' day, nor of most other religions, are surely among the most remarkable and original ethical ideas ever presented. If they were widely followed... I would have no hesitation in placing Jesus first in this book. But the truth is that they are not widely followed. In fact, they're not even generally accepted. Most Christians consider the injunction to love your enemy as at most an ideal which might be realized in some perfect world, but one which is not a reasonable guide to conduct in the actual world we live in. We do not normally practice it, do not expect others to practice it, and do not teach our children to practice it. Jesus' most distinctive teaching, therefore, remains an intriguing, but basically, untried suggestion. Now, you can argue with him if you want to, but I think he makes a pretty powerful case. Just think about our Christian communities and how much we teach love your enemy in this real world. The reason that Jesus is ranked number three and not number one is us, the Christian community. The followers of Jesus haven't been influenced that much by Jesus. We don't take Jesus seriously when it comes to loving our enemies. Jesus' most unique ethical teaching is something that we leave aside on the ash heap of irrelevancy again and again. Who is the enemy? Who is your enemy? Reverend Mark Barnes, a follower of Jesus, speaking at the Republican National Convention, proclaimed in a benediction that our enemy is not other Republicans, but Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party. For so many others, Donald Trump is the enemy. Or radical Islam, or jihadists, or fundamentalists, or liberals. It's us versus them. That's our world's way of thinking. The psychologist Sam Keane wrote a powerful book called Faces of the Enemy, Reflections of a Hostile Imagination. And Keene explores the psychology, psychology of enmity. He uses political art from opposite sides of various conflicts in the 20th century. And we see the same dynamic on either side of the conflict of dehumanizing the other to justify the violence in which we engage. I want to take Keene's work on the creation of enemies and put a theological spin to it. Um, back in April of 1999, and some of you will have a hard time seeing this, this was the cover from Newsweek magazine. This was when the U.S. was building up for a NATO campaign to bomb Serbia. And it says here, it's a picture, this is Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, he was, uh, before some of you were aware of what was going on in the world, Slobodan Milosevic was the dictator of Serbia. And it says there, if you can't see it, the face of evil. You want to see the face of evil? There it is. 
There it is. And that's true. Milosevic is or was the face of evil. But you could put Dan Buttrey's picture up here and label it the face of evil, and that would be true as well. Because doesn't the Bible say that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? All of us have evil within us. But you could take this photo of Milosevic and replace the headline with the image of God. That is the image of God. Because isn't the image of God in each and every one of us? And you could also put my face there as the image of God. The key theological truth is that our fallen humanness is a mix of both. The glorious image of God stamped upon our very being, but also that being is cracked, marred, distorted by the evil of sin. And that was true of Slobodan Milosevic, and it's true of me, it's true of you, it's true of Donald Trump, it's true of Hillary Clinton, it's true of every member of ISIS, it's true of every Syrian refugee, it's true of every Israeli and every Palestinian, and of everyone from every polarity and conflicted relationship you can think of. We are all the image of God and the face of evil. And the first act of violence is denying the image of God in another human being. We take a cleaver to this complex unity of our humanity and we split off the face of evil from the image of God. And we slap the face of evil upon our enemy. What are we left with? Why, I've got the image of God. And my enemy is so vile, so evil, and now, of course, I'm God's agent. I am there to deal with this vile threat to our goodness in the world. And anything is justified, and we are righteous in whatever we do. Jesus stands in contrast to this oh-so-human bifurcating tendency and simply says, Love your enemy. That enemy as terrible as their actions may be, is also made in the image of God. That enemy is the object of God's love. That enemy is the one God so loved that God sent the divine Son that this person not perish but have everlasting life. That enemy is someone who one day may be my brother or sister in Christ. So love that enemy. Jesus commands. If not for the awful past or the terrible present, perhaps for the imagined future. Love our enemies. See them with the eyes of God. See them through the heart of God. See them as fully human. See them with compassion, even if we are appalled by and must stand against some of the things that they do. And here we get some help from the words of the Apostle Paul that I read from 2 Corinthians. We can engage in struggle, in war, if you will. But people aren't the enemy. Rather, war itself is. Structures, policies, mindsets, fears, narratives, self-limiting beliefs, these are what we struggle against. What Paul calls strongholds, arguments, and pretensions. We struggle, but we use different weapons than the world uses. Paul speaks about it in a different way, but also a form of struggle in Romans 12, 19 to 21. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Do you hear the struggle in that? Overcome evil with good? But you see, we don't use the world's weapons. We don't respond with an eye for an eye violence. Instead, we respond to evil through good means, feeding hungry enemies, giving drink to the thirsty enemy. This is what we call conflict transformation, overcoming evil with good. We engage in the conflicts, but in a way that transforms the very dynamic of the conflict, that transforms the relationship. We reject the us versus them creation of enemies, and instead we see us and the other as a community, a conflicted community with serious issues, but a human community. And in that changed relationship, we then get to work at problem solving, building the good, 
constructing the positive out of the negative. And that, my friends, can be a long, hard process. To quote another Baptist figure from Marnie's generation, Walker Knight said, Peace, like war, is waged. Overcoming evil with good is not a quick fix. It's not making nice and the problems go away. Nonviolence isn't possible without being a baptized warrior spirit, a long, having a long-term courageous discipline with love as its guiding force. So let me flip the script for a few minutes to steal a phrase from my kids a few years back. You know, we have these narratives that we tell the storylines that are played out in the media about our conflicts, whether it's our election here in the U.S. or the wars in the Middle East. And the story spins out the script for us and for our enemies and about what must be done to overcome the evil of our enemies. Well, we're going to flip that script and we're going to hear about transformation. A few years ago, I visited the town of Srebrenica in Bosnia. In a few bloody days in 1995, Serb militiamen massacred 8,000 Muslim boys and men, the largest mass murder in Europe since the end of World War II. And the killers weren't Muslims. The killers were Christians, and the victims were Muslims. And the surviving Muslims were driven out of their town, and to this day they have not been allowed to return to their homes. I visited the memorial to this massacre, and outside the gates were the policemen of Srebrenica, Serbs, who most likely participated in the massacre. The killers are still there. They're still unpunished. And yet the memorial was amazing. There were blocks of, of granite that made this huge arc around a plaza and chiseled into that granite were the 8,000 names of the murdered men and boys. And besides the name were the ages. I saw ages as young as two. Imagine killing a two-year-old and as old as 70. Alongside the chiseled names, there was a fascinating quote from the Quran. Can you, can, what, what kind of quote do you think from the Quran they should come up with? This is what they came up with. It may be that God will bring about friendship between you and those you hold to be your enemies. That was the quote from the Quran chosen by the grieving families to reflect their hopes even while justice was still being denied to them. And then the mothers of Serbanitsa inscribed this prayer in a stone pillar beside the graves of their loved ones. They say, in the name of God, the most merciful and compassionate, we pray to God, Almighty God, may grievance become hope, may revenge become justice, and may mother's tears become prayers that Serbernitsa never happen again to no one, nowhere. They pray that their own understandable feelings and fantasies of revenge be overturned by, by genuine justice that also ends all the cycles of murder, that there may be no more Serbernitsas anywhere for anyone, not just for Bosnians, but also for Serbs. Not just for Muslims, but also for Christians. Never again to no one, nowhere. That was the memorial of the weeping women of Srebrenica. Those amazing Muslim women who were waging peace and they were following the teaching of Jesus better than those who claimed to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. So here we are. In a special place of learning, Carson Newman University, it's 2016. And we are seeing the ugliest political campaign in my lifetime. We're seeing wars go on in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Ukraine. There are other conflicts less visible in Central African Republic and Congo. But our time is no worse than others. I lived through the Cold War. I remember the wars in Central America, Argentina's dirty war, and, and the, the wars El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala. I remember the war in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos and Bangladesh, Ethiopia and Eritrea, Sudan, and, and we could go on and on. I remember gang violence in our city being so much worse. And we bring pay, pay, peace to a place like Colombia after a long, terrible war and perhaps now also to Myanmar. 
And yet tomorrow another place is going to descend into chaos and violence. And then there are the struggles in our own families, our churches, our, our local communities. How do we carry out the struggle for peace today and tomorrow? How do we wage peace in our time? Well, that's a long, long thing, and I could do the lecture until tonight on that. But let me focus in two areas that I think are the key fronts for waging peace today, where I believe that we can be engaged in transformative work. The first is the area of our minds. Albert Einstein once said, the splitting of the atom changed everything, save man's mode of thinking. How we think, how we think about conflict, how we think about war, that's key. That's the key front line for the struggle for peace and transformation. I believe Jesus was challenging us that with his command to love our enemies, changing how we think about our enemies. And we are addressing that with conflict transformation training. You know, much has been done over the past few decades, developing peace studies programs and other academic means of studying conflict and finding the best practices for bringing positive results out of conflict. And that's great. You've got your, what is it, Faith and Justice uh, program. It's fantastic to see that happening in academic context. I'm 100% for that. When I was a student, you couldn't find a course in this field, let alone get a degree. And now there are so many schools with such academic programs. But the challenge before us is how to take what we've learned and bring it to the conflict zones. Whether we're talking about the devastated cities of Syria or the halls of Congress or the halls of our local schools or around our kitchen tables or around the negotiation tables in the neighborhoods and barrios and barangays, we need to bring these principles and practices to the very places where people live their lives and sometimes kill each other as they hash out their conflicts. And so we're undertaking popular education education that is brought to where people live and that engages them in a holistic way. It's also education that respects the wisdom that comes that already is there in the communities and is rooted in their own cultures. You know, all the answers, I'm sorry to say this in this uh, uh, prestigious institution, but all the answers don't come from academia. Some of the answers, I was hoping to get an amen, but... Um, some of the answers from academia actually come from studying what's happening in the communities where people live out their lives and their conflicts. Well, I call this popular education back in the communities the university of the streets. We need popular education that connects to where people live so that they can act transformatively within their conflicts in those contexts. So I developed a 10-day intensive training of conflict transformation trainers. We call it the TCTT. And we've held these trainings now in North America, Asia, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Africa. And we got plans to be in Latin America in spring of next, next year. And out of our TCTT grads, we've seen the growth of an amazing cadre of trainers and activists, especially in Africa. I could go on and on telling you stories about these amazing peacemakers, and so I'll try to be brief. My wife Sharon and I led a 10-day TCTT in Kenya in 2013, and among our participants was 23-year-old Boaz Kaibarak from northern Kenya. I had visited Boaz and where he lived earlier. It's a rural area in northern Kenya where, where wealth is based on cattle. And the Pokots and the Turkanas had engaged in cycles of violence, uh, often around cattle rustling. And the whole region called Turkwell is so volatile and so heavily armed, the Kenyan police won't even go there. The army won't even go there. But Boaz goes there unarmed, trying to find the ways to peace. Well, shortly after our TCTT program, Turkwell exploded in violence between the Pokots and the Turkanas. And Boaz sold some of his goats so that he could rent a vehicle to travel all the way to Turkwell. And he went to the center of the conflict where a tribal village was under siege by the rival tribe. And Boaz used the processes and skills for mediation and conflict resolution we'd taught him to facilitate so that he could facilitate an end to the siege. 
He also established weekly consultations between tribal elders to keep the issues from exploding into violence. And then Boaz used another young man uh, that was in that Kenya TCTT, Philip Kaibarak, or excuse me, Philip Kakangulu from Uganda. And they co-facilitated conflict transformation trainings under the trees <laughs> outside uh, with Pokots and Turkanas together. And they, they led a peace walk between the communities. You know, Boaz and Philip have taken the skills and the tools of conflict transformation that they learned from the University of the Streets and they put it into peacemaking action in rural Kenya. And Boaz continues to work and to train. They've even established peace churches, congregations. All the churches are, are tribal churches, one tribe or another. And he, they've established congregations drawing from all the tribes, from Pokots, Turkanas, and others, worshiping together as brothers and sisters under the banner of the Prince of Peace. And Philip, he's, he's been absolutely incredible. Done workshops in Uganda to prevent violence around the elections. He's done workshops on nonviolence and trauma healing for vi minorities who've been victims of violence. He and his wife Lana have held workshops in the refugee camps in Ethiopia near South Sudan. And Philip's gone into South Sudan even while the war is going on, the civil war there, holding peace building workshops. These folks are amazing peace warriors. And I could go on telling about Lance and Christina in Zimbabwe who are reaching Nigeria and Zambia and Malawi and South Africa. I could tell about Fabrice Kettlemalet in Central African Republic. He's not even 25 years old and he's been training young men in Christian militias in his peace workshops. And the Muslim community heard about it and they've invited Fabrice to come and train them. And the U.S. Embassy was so impressed with what Fabrice was doing that they have supported some of his peace-building workshops. This is the kind of grassroots peace work that's going on. It's bubbling from the ground up. It's getting noticed because of the impact it's happening. Do you remember a couple years ago the uh, Ice Bucket Challenge, uh, that uh, fundraiser for ALS uh, research, a condition called Lou Gehrig's disease? Did any of you do the Ice Bucket Challenge? We got a few folks here, yeah. I had some friends who did it and they never challenged me. I was waiting. I was, I was psyched and ready. So don't you do that, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but the ice bucket challenge, you know, one person would pour a bucket of ice water on their head and uh, then challenge three others on video to do the same with everybody supporting the ALS research. And that challenge went viral through social media and it became the biggest fundraiser for ALS research that has ever been, been done. Well, we need to make peacemaking go viral as much as pouring a bucket of water over your head. This kind of experiential training seems to be headed that way. We're already seeing the beginning of a geometric curve in training peacemaker skills. There's this multiplier effect beginning to take hold and we're seeing it in some of the toughest places to grow this work. Uganda, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Central African Republic, Burundi, Kenya, Ethiopia, South Sudan with these amazing African peacemakers. We're picking it up in places like Northeast India, Myanmar, Indonesia, the Philippines, Lebanon, Ukraine, and Hong Kong. We're training people in the things that make for peace. And that can be one of the most impactful, positive way to change our conflicts because we change the mind from fear to hope. We, we, we change the mind so they can see what we can do in this struggle to overcome evil with good. And that brings me to the second area of transformative work, interfaith peacemaking. I could give you a complete lecture about interfaith work in our current global context. You can... Check that out online if you want. I've got a website, danbuttry.com. Feel free to look at it. That, that presentation is there. But, you know, our older interfaith movement was rather anemic. It sometimes sounded like a joke. A Muslim, a Jew, and a Christian got together. <laughs> uh, and we'd have these dialogues. Sometimes we'd bring in a Hindu, a Buddhist, perhaps a Baha'i or a Sikh. And each one of them would be on a panel, they would be on a panel together and would politely discuss some topic and try not to offend anybody. It was very, very nice. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's necessary. But there is another interfaith movement that is going on. It's a movement of extremism, of wedding nationalism and religion. And this extremism is getting a lot of play right now related to Muslims. 
the so-called radical Islam. And it is real, and it is a threat. But there is also radical Christianity, including in this country. There's radical Judaism. There's radical Hinduism. There's radical Buddhism. Every major religion that is dominant somewhere in the world has an extreme expression that can be and often is violent, especially to people of other religions. And these movements of whatever religion have more in common with each other than they do with their own co-religionists who seek more peaceful and accommodating engagement with others. To counter such interfaith extremism, we need to up our game in interfaith relationships and peacemaking. Dialogue won't cut it anymore. We have to become far more intentional, far more engaged, and we have to take on the really tough places of religious encounter in transformative ways. I'm one of the founders and officers of the Interfaith Leadership Council in Detroit. We formed in the wake of September 11th attacks when one of our Muslim businessmen said we needed to do more than pray and hold hands. And so we've been involved in the typical dialogues, but we've also done service projects together, housing, literacy, warmth in winter campaigns. We've also done religious diversity education in public schools and universities. We've stood together against religious vandalism and violence and stood against bigotry. Recently, Imam Steve Elturk of the Islamic Organization of North America asked me about the conflict transformation training that I was doing around the world, and he was interested in doing an Islamic version of it. So we got together, and I put out my 10-day TCTT design, and for every Bible story that I had dealing with conflict transformation topics, I asked if he could identify a similar story from Islamic tradition dealing with that particular topic. And, and just like that, Steve would come up with them. Soon we had the design for an Islamic training, and last December, Steve and I did a pilot project in his mosque, a four-day training. And we're exploring doing the Muslim training in larger Muslim communities in the U.S. and even taking it to other parts of the world. We also have uh, started doing multi-religious conflict transformation in Detroit, uh, drawing people from all kinds of various faiths. And uh, already we're seeing some connections, particularly with our Muslim training, and the stories and ideas and the tools that we're doing reaching beyond us into the Middle East and Africa and Asia. And it's very exciting to see. Conflict transformation training and revamped, re-energized interfaith relationships. These are the two areas of transformative engagement with the conflict struggles of our days that bring the most hope to me. We're seeing an impact, and we're feeling a rising tide of energy and hope. But it's not easy by any means. But many of us like to think of ourselves as peace warriors. As warriors, we don't quit. We don't give up. We don't cower when the going gets tough. One of our Kenyan peace warriors likes to end all our trainings and even our basic communications with a chant, Amani Malele, which in Swahili means peace forever. Now, uh, it may not be academic uh, enough for such a fine institution as this, but that's how we do it in the University of the Streets. So if you'll indulge me, let's end the, the lecture with this chant. So I'm going to say Amani and you say Malele, okay? And then I'll say Malele, and you say Amani. And then we'll do peace forever, forever, peace, okay? So Amani? Malele. Gosh, you sound like Episcopalians, not Baptists. Let's try it again. Amani? Malele? Malele. 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 Peace? Forever? forever. Peace. God bless you.